Hello and welcome back to the Across the Pod NFL podcast. It is time to review week 11 as we are edging, edging ever so closer to the NFL playoffs. I am, as ever, your host, Andy Davis, and I'm this week joined by a returning guest, someone I had the pleasure of actually meeting for the first time in person at the London Games. Back with us today is George on Sports, otherwise known as George Agata. George, first of all, how are things? How have you been? I'm great, man. I'm great. I'm, I'm a, little, a little bit sad, actually. You just mentioned we're getting closer to playoffs. Is it really that close already? I mean, I feel like we've only just started. I don't want the season to end just yet. So can we slow it down? Uh, but aside from that, I'm great. I mean, I got to watch the Colts play in Germany and be sidelined. So I can't really complain, man. I cannot complain. Absolutely. I mean, it's that time of year now where it's sort of getting towards the juicy part of the season. You got, I think when Thanksgiving football comes around, that's when, you know, that's when, you know, right, this is crunch time of the season. Our teams are going to go from the tent. The pretenders are going to be pretenders. The contenders are going to be contenders. They're going to separate from each other. And obviously, the not long till Christmas now, but just over a month away. It's exciting times and it's, um, you know, down the stretch, it's the best time of year for NFL football. And, you know, when you get those Christmas Eve games and all that, it's oh so fun. Uh, but you mentioned it, Germany then, of course, you watch Christmas the- Day too. Christmas Day, yeah. I mean, that's actually, I think this year is really good because you've got the whole Christmas Day slate and also New Year's Eve as well. So um, I don't think I'm doing any anything New Year's Eve now. I think my plans are truly staying indoors, <laughs> watching the games. And um, I think it's Bengals Chiefs on New Year's Eve, which actually now is probably actually less for content. Oh, man. It, it, yeah. Obviously, Bo Mahomes has been great. But um, yeah, that's that. I think we've got the Cowboys Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. It's there's some great games on these days mm-hmm. as well. So um, yeah, the NBA has completely just been swept aside now. It's now no longer the NBA. <laughs> now it's um, NFL's day. Yes, NBA. It's no longer the NBA day. It's the, it's the NFL because we've got yeah. all these great games. But of course, you you alluded to then. You did spend time in Germany um, for both games, uh, which I sadly wasn't a part of this year. Uh, as the Dolphins played the Chiefs and the and the Colts played the Patriots. Of course, your team being the Colts. Um, just for those who didn't get to go to the game, those who listen to this podcast or watching it on YouTube, who didn't get to experience Frankfurt, only watching it on TV. Just how was that experience, but also how was the experience of seeing your team play for, I believe, the second time in person? Yeah, so firstly, the general experience, both weekends, immense, amazing, unbelievable. The German fans are legit. I mean, again, they've got a huge NFL fan base, both hardcore fans and casual fans. Uh, They've got a massive domestic uh, American football base uh, uh, league too with the GFL, which have been running solidly for years. I mean, the fans, were they were all over it. And also, you need to remember, uh, the international home market team for Germany are the Kansas City Chiefs. So they came ready, man. They were, I interviewed so many people who came straightly, uh, who flew straight direct from Kansas. Many, many German fans as well. It was unbelievable. Um, the stadium was a sea of red. Uh, likewise, come the following weekend for the Colts game, it was a sea of, I don't know if you want to call it red and blue for the Patriots. It felt like a very, very, very Patriots home game. Um, again, the Patriots are, you know, they're obsessed with, with, with Germany and being that Tom Brady played the, the first NFL game in Germany last season in Munich, although it was with the Buccaneers. Um, you know, he he kind of holds weight in, in Germany. So that went down a storm for them, except we beat them and sent them packing. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, being being there as a Colts fan was immense. You're right. It's the second time I've seen them play live in the flesh. The first time was in London, 2015, 16 or 17 against the Jays. Um, where we lost to Blake Bortles, even though we had Andrew Luck. Um, so I've been waiting to get my revenge of watching them play live, and I got to do that uh, a couple of weekends ago. But, I mean, being the access that I had was on real, man. So sideline access, press conference, post-game conference, lock- not locker room. Uh, close to people like Jonathan Taylor, Josh Downs, Michael Putman Jr., Isaiah McKenzie, Shane Steichen, uh, Bernard Ryman, the left tackle who had 18 members of his family here, um, there in Germany, sorry. He, he was born and raised in Austria, I speak fluent German, so really it was like a homecoming game for him. His family are not able to watch him play because obviously the, the, the travel is, is, is so far away and this 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 time I was, I was actually um, I was out in the street getting fan interviews like I do, mingling with people and his, this family came and um, they were standing right in front of my camera as I was filming someone and they just stood there staring at me and I was thinking, what's happening here? Obviously I'm wearing Colts gear, I'm standing by the helmet and everyone obviously assumed a lot of people assumed I actually worked or played for the Colts, which I take as a great compliment, great, great compliment. Um, but then someone from the crowd was like, do you know who this woman is? And I was like, I have no idea. She was like, Oh, this, the lady was like, this lady, Bernard Ryman's mother. 
And I immediately went, oh my God, I've heard the stories about how much he's happy to have you guys here and play so i immediately had her as an interview in fact you've just reminded me i need to put that out but um no it was great it was an unforgettable experience um you know not again not many people can probably say they've they've got to cover i say cover because i did my own commentary of the game which i found so so damn fun um and i've still been putting highlights out of that but not many people get to say they, they had that experience and um i'm just very very grateful that i was a part of it all i can imagine and i just want to I'm intrigued about, you know, I saw that you were in your Colts gear that game, and I saw a friend of the show, Sky, was in his Patriots gear. Now, how much were you two sort of, were you n- near each other in the in the press? Yeah. How was that um, back and forth? So, uh, firstly, I arrived Friday very early morning, and the plan was to go to the Patriots press conference where Sky was. Um, I couldn't make it for different reasons. I was busy planning for other things, so I couldn't go. But also, I, w- I came dressed in Colts gear. If I had entered the Patriots training, they probably would have kicked me out immediately. So <laughs> I wasn't, ta- I wasn't taking that chance. So I met with Sky at the Colts uh, post uh, pre-game conference. Sky had taken off his Patriots gear. Very clever of him to do that. Um, <laughs> so he was there for that. But for the game, I think Sky was li- Sky and Freddie from Franchise Tag were literally one row in front of me. Literally one row in front of me. Um, so yeah, it was good. I mean, Sky had nothing to cheer about. Clearly, it was me. You all you could hear was me behind him on the mic screaming, "Dyra Dangbo, first sack of the game." Uh, Jonathan Taylor scores a touchdown. Josh Jones makes the best catch of his career. So yeah, he had nothing to be happy about. But I was loving life. <laughs> I bet, I bet. And it's um, you know, I've said before on the podcast countless times I've been to five Dolphins games, and never seen us win a game in person. So very jealous uh... that you got to see your team win in person, but um. Yeah, that, that deal Don't get me wrong. The, the, yeah, the scoreline was a bit meh, 10 6. But hey, I was loving every single second. Yeah, win to win. You, you, exactly. You, you'd rather win ugly than lose pretty. You know what I mean? You'd rather win 10 6 and lose 54 51, for example. You'd rather that, I think. It's, all day long. Uh, it's, yeah, it's all about right now just getting the wins and just building for the postseason. Um, but we are here to talk all things week 11 in the NFL, which started on Thursday Night Football. And now this really links into the first Sunday game, a game I was at. Um, so the Cincinnati Bengals took on the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore. The Ravens did win 34 to 20. And then on Sunday, the Browns took on the Steelers and the Browns won by 13 to 10. Now, this has really shaken up the AFC North because if you haven't missed it, if you have missed it, I should say, firstly, where have you been? Uh, but Joe Burrow has suffered. Uh. Jihad did suffer during the game a season-ending, I believe it was a wrist injury, um, which yep. the whole season in doubt. And then fast forward to the Sunday game, and prior to this game, the Sean Watson suffered a season-ending injury as well. So really has shaken up the AFC North, and mm-hmm. Browns still got the win. They're still amazingly 7-2, despite Watson's really inconsistent form this season. Just how you see in the AFC North, the Ravens North. now are clear number one. I think they're probably the favourites. I'll probably run away with it. But in terms of the rest of the teams, in terms of yeah. you know, plenty of wild cards, plus I think at least the Browns, I think both the Browns and the Steelers are both in the playoffs yeah. at the moment. Just how are you seeing that whole AFC North picture and what's been happening with those teams this season? So, so for me, historically, and this is pre Joe Burrow injury, the Bengals normally start off slow, normally start off like one one in three, and then they heat up and make the playoffs. This is a very different season. The calf injury ruined quite a bit for him and the rest of the squad. And then he looked healthy. Then he looked good. And there was a time where I was like, oh my gosh, yep, the Bengals are all the way back. They're all the way back. And then he suffers the wrist season ending wrist injury, which um, is a massive blow for the Bengals. So automatically, unless they sign someone, I don't know, like a, like a, like a Dobbs who obviously isn't going to go over there. He's just signed by the Vikings. But I think they're pretty, I, I want to say they're kind of out of the running now. I'm already bottom of the division, so I think they're kind of done for. What really takes me by surprise is these Steelers, man. I mean, just when I think Mike Tomlin might be having, you know, be heading for a losing season, they just they just manage to win ugly. They do it week in. I think they're six and three now, I believe it is, or seven and three. I just don't understand how they manage to win these games. I mean, Najee Harris is terrible. I said he'd be like this because they ran him into the ground last season, ultimately because they had no other choice. Jalen Warren has come on strong. He had a big game, but to have that game against that Cleveland defense is very, very impressive. Um, I've never been a fan of Kenny Pickett. Uh, two glove Kenny Kenny Pickett, I call him. Um, obviously, when you've got guys like Deontay Johnson and 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 um, George Pickens and Pat Fryer, who I think is coming back off IR, you always have a chance. And obviously, you've got a decent defense led by TJ Watt. But the Steelers, for me, 
I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, sneak their way up there because they just seem to always get it done. And it's always ugly. It's never like a clean sweep. It's never like looking pretty. They just win ugly. Then you talk about the Browns, another team who have absolutely mystified me because even with Deshaun Watson, they weren't great. They weren't. They lost Nick Chubb, for God's sake. They lost one of the best top three running backs in the league. I think people were forgetting that. How they've managed to stay relevant, they bring back Kareem Hunt, I get it. They've got Ford, I get it. Um, but I mean, then that really that you look at their you look at their roster, you don't really expect them to be where they are right now. In particular, without Deshaun Watson, who wasn't great anyway. Their defense is what's doing it for them, and they say defense wins championships. And I guess in this case, it's doing something right because they're what second in the division or third now, tied second with the Steelers. Oh, yeah, I think. Uh, second, yeah, I think they're the fifth seed in the AFC at the moment. No, bro, they are the fifth. Are they, yeah, they are the fifth seed. Yeah, with Pittsburgh sixth, and I forget who's in seventh place, but um. Yeah, no, it's I'm not I, too it's, sure. Uh, honestly, track. like the the Browns and the Steelers. Yeah, the Browns and the Steelers really, really like. I mean, the Ravens. Yeah, clearing above. I mean, I know they lost to the Browns. They should never lost that game. But at that point, for me, they were the best team in the league, and Lamar Jackson was looking like the MVP. In my opinion, he's still up there, and they're still a great team. They obviously let that lead slip, which is not not good enough, really, to the Browns. You know, they 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 had that game. Um, but it just shakes up so much because you look at the first few weeks of the season and you go, okay, this is how the AFC North is going to shake out and you have a rough idea of what's happening and where, where teams are going to fall. But I always say it's not, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And you mentioned it. This point of the season is pivotal. This is where you start to play your football. And if you can start to turn the, turn the page like what the Bengals would be doing at this point if they had uh, Joe Burrow, no, that's no longer the case. It's now a case of, all right, so the Ravens are really going to top the division. I, I, I imagine they'll stay there. It's just the Browns and the Steelers are just dog fights, man. They just, they just, they love these gritty games, and I don't know how, but they just always find a way to win. And that's just the motto, I suppose. The man, it's one game at a time. If you can find a way to win, move on to the next one. These teams are sitting at six and three, seven and three. And I, I honestly, I, I did not see that coming for, for neither of those teams. Absolutely, I think when you know the season starts, I think no one, will, I certainly wouldn't have put the Browns seven and three. And you know, looking at now, they're they're the right. with seven and three. Texans are the sixth seed, they're six and four after their win against the Cardinals on Sunday. And then the mm-hmm. Steelers are seventh and six and four. But, you know, it's just tight conference and, you know, things can change. Because you look at even further down, you've got the Bills eighth, their six wins. You guys are ninth with five wins. Broncos tenth mm-hmm. with five wins. They're on a great run. So, you yeah. know, that's a very tight. And even the Raiders in the 12th seed. Are- I know, man. Well, so the NFC is a bit more of a, of a um, less tight affair. But that AFC... Yeah race is so hot because I think you know, the Ravens are now the number one seed in the AFC so they're probably going to win that division but mm-hmm. you know when I was at that game on Sunday it was the perfect football game to go to the way even though it was a terrible game it was cold weather it was two gritty teams a division rivalry and I think they're going to be batting out for um for I think they could both do it I think take the Browns I think will do it because that defense sort of I think they do enough to win your games and then if you've got yeah. someone like you said Kareem Hunt um, Jerome Ford, and you've yeah. got if DTR can just get it down the field at least to like Amari Cooper. There's a they got some great receivers there as well. So I think their team to watch out for. I think the Steelers are probably the the worst of two. I don't. I think they get to playoffs. They're probably going to lose mm-hmm. in the round. But the Browns could do something. You know, if they go up against I don't know the Jags or even ourselves yeah. in in in, in players, which could happen. And I think that is the current state of as we're playing the Browns in the wild card rounds. You wouldn't be shocked if they won that game because. If you've got Miles Garrett in your team, I mean, it's just a fantastic defense. And and that offense has, I think, has got enough. As long as that defense is playing to, to the full level. Also, though, to note on the, on, the, on the Browns, Joe Flacco has been signed to the uh, practice squad, uh, right? Yes. And I, I, I mean, I'm, I should be honest with you, you've got guys like Jacoby Brissett. Um, and other guys who are just waiting on the sidelines for these other teams. Why not go grab one of them? What you, Joe Flacco is a capable guy, but he ain't been in the league for what two, three years. What on earth are you doing signing someone like that when you've got guys who are game ready right now? It seems crazy. I mean, it's been it's been a year of backups. I mean, it's you have Gardner Minshew. You've got obviously Zach Wilson was a backup at the start yeah. of the year. Now it's obviously Tim Boyle. Um, obviously, <laughs> the Browns got back up to him with obviously. Thompson Robinson, and there's so many teams that got backups, and obviously Josh Dobbs, um, a lot of and mm-hmm. a lot of these teams. But you know these Browns. I mean, it's the, the defense alone. I think that if they can just win you games, if they could, if their defense just plays, if their, their defense plays at top level, the offense doesn't need to be at its best. Mm-hmm. I think you've got a solid 
sort of foundation, yeah. solid offense that can, even if it's like, you know, like the game on Sunday, for example, it was a very tight affair. Just one touchdown made the difference. And, you know, in the end, it happened. But, you know, and they got down the field, they got enough yards to get the field goal range. So this team is, um, it's scarily good when when they're on form, and I think that they're a team that certainly um, shouldn't be ruled out of contention for at least maybe one or two playoff wins. Um, I think they could. I don't think they're going to be a team. Mm-hmm. That win it. I don't think they're going to make it to Vegas, but I think certainly they could no. cause an upset, and they could beat. I think most, on the day, most teams they've beaten the Ravens already this year, even though they probably would have wouldn't have most years, you know. And they obviously they. I think they could beat the Chiefs on the day with that defense alone. So, um, so yeah, yeah no, potentially, think, yeah. Their team to, I think, a dark horse for, for the Super Bowl. I think they're a dark horse to make a stir in the playoffs, let's say. Um, other results on Sunday include the Chargers losing to the Packers in Lambeau <laughs> Field by 23 points to 20. Uh, the Dolphins beating the Raiders 20 to 13, which was a battle of my household. Um, Giants beat the Commanders 31 to 19. The Cowboys beating the Panthers 33 to 10. The Jaguars beating the Tennessee Titans 34 to 14. The Bu- the Buccaneers losing to the 49ers 27 to 14. The Bills beating the Jets 32 to 6. And the Rams beating the Seahawks 17 to 16. Now our final game of the Sunday slate I want to talk about is the game involving the Chicago Bears and the Detroit Lions. Now we mentioned comebacks earlier. This is another mm. example of a great comeback. The, the Lions were down and out in the fourth quarter, got through for three or more interceptions in this game, and the Lions came back. Uh, and they now moved to 8-2 and two, um, in quite an astonishing season. I mean, we all had these yeah. hopes. After, after, after how they did last season down the stretch, we all had these hopes that the Lions would you know, come out and be a, a great team and potentially win the NFC North, which I think they might do now. But mm-hmm. did anyone think they could be 8-2? and two? I, I doubt it. And they, they look legit. They look like they could actually challenge for the NFC title. I mean, look, I've been, outside of being a, a huge UK Colts fan and, and wherever you want to call it, biggest Colts fan in the UK, I've had a lot to say about the likes of the Lions over the last few seasons. Like, I feel like I need to dig up my, my past and some of the takes that I've said because I've huge on the Lions, absolutely huge on the Lions. Ever since they hired Dan Campbell, who brought the aggression, brought the motor, brought the energy, brought the passion back to Detroit, um, I've always said I've got a soft spot for the Lions. I don't support them. I just want them to do well. Like, And they've been so close in so many seasons, the last few seasons, and now you're really seeing it pay off. And also, shout out to Jared Goff, man, because I've always said you don't need to be Josh Allen. You don't need to be Patrick Mahomes. You don't need to be Jalen Hurts. You just need to be Jared Goff. Look after the ball, which he's done for most of his career. All right, cool. He threw three picks in the game against the Bears, but he hasn't thrown. He didn't. He had the the longest uh, streak of of uh, completed passes without a pick or whatever it was until earlier this season. And you can see what they're doing. They they are so bought into Dan Campbell and what this team what this team means to Detroit. I feel like this is the definition. You know, like when a team loses, the whole and this is probably the case for all teams in the league. But when the team loses, the city's down. When the team wins, the team is up. Detroit is absolutely bouncing right now. And I'm honestly, I'm so happy for the Lions. Um, I'm in Marcel Brown. Um, Josh, Josh Reynolds, you've got obviously uh, the running backs, Montgomery and Jimmy Gibbs, who are just lights out, honestly. And their defense, they got the number one O line or two O line in the league. They're just so slept on. And I just feel like I want them to do so well. Honestly, I love everything that the Lions do. I'm not surprised at eight and two by any means. I've backed them for the last two or three seasons now. I'm just glad it's actually coming to fruition. Um, it, it felt like after last season, this would be the season that they make that leap. If, if, if at any time it was going to happen, it had to be this season, given how close they were last season with the close losses and all, you know, losing games at the very death a certain so many of their games. I think it was last season or maybe even the season before that. So honestly, the Lions, I love what they're doing and I hope they continue to go on and win. As for the Bears, ooh. okay, you bring, you know, you bring Fields back who obviously looked better, looked good. Um, obviously having the lead and then in my mind, I was like, are the, are the Bears going to actually go and win this? I mean, I always had faith that the Lions would, would at least make a comeback attempt. But for Montgomery to seal the game against his former team, I believe it was fourth and one. Uh, they'd gone through it a few times at the line and couldn't make it. And third and one or fourth and one, they go through with Montgomery and he he runs into the end zone. Um, heartbreak for the Bears, joy for the for the for the Lions. And oh, I just I, I, again, I can't I can't speak highly enough about about these Lions. But the Bears, I think they've got what two number one picks they've got in in, in the top five. So really. If you're clever about this thing, you've got some pieces there. You've got Mooney, who I'm not sure is the guy. You've already got rid of Chase Claypool. Justin Fields is your main man, or supposedly isn't. We'll, we'll soon find out. Um, 
need to bolster that defense massively. Need to do something about that O-line. There are so many holes in this squad. Wide receiver. The only position that I quite like is tight end. Obviously, you've got Cole Komet, and I forget who the backup is, but they're looking all right there. Everywhere else is up for grabs. And their picks, it can do a lot of good things with these picks. Either trade out, use a pick, use a number, use a pick and get a quarterback. You know, there's a lot of talk about Caleb Williams. Um, I don't know. It's the, the Bears need a lot of work, but they, 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 I don't want to say they're set up because they, they've got the picks, but how they handle their offseason business and the draft and everything else from here is going to be very, very um, influential on how the rest of their their, their time uh, as Chicago Bears club uh, goes. I totally agree because I did a touch on this in my piece. Forgive me, sport. I think it was mm. last week about the Bears where they currently hold two of the top five picks. They're currently first because of their. The, the trade with the Panthers. Panthers last year, and they got the fourth pick through their own record. So, mm. you know, it's interesting what what they do now because I think if you can get, I think you can go two ways. You can either go for Caleb Williams and get him someone like a receiver fourth or out mm-hmm. or, or get defensive player, or you can give Fields another weapon alongside DJ Moore and somehow. Oh, sorry, I forgot about him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think if you can get. They could go rope and go Marvin Harrison, the first overall pick, to give Fields that guy. And then they go out and mm. get one of the top defensive players this year. I think that's something they could go down the move. But I think at the same time, they passed on the number one prospect last year, callback wise. Mm-hmm. Will they do it again for a second year if Fields continues to struggle or maybe be a bit average or mid tier? Mm-hmm. Like Taylor Williams is there for the taking a generational talent, and they're saying it's hard for them to pass up again a second year in a row. So I, I'm really intrigued what they do. But the Lions, you know, you've alluded to it as well. I mean, th- their, their team is stacked. I mean, not have mentioned the defence. Aiden Hutchinson is an absolute yeah. beast. And for the second year in a row, it appears the second overall pick is better than the first overall pick. I mean, yeah. Draymond Walker's not done an awful lot in my memory. And Bryce Young so far looks a disaster. Albeit, I think oh, he'll man. <laughs> but when you got CJ Stroud this year, second overall pick. Aiden Hutchinson last year. It's, you know, He's been an absolute dog, and he's just been pretty much like Nick Bosa when he came in. Literally straight away, yeah. you knew yeah. his talent was there, and from then on, there it's not really changed. And you know, if if Goff has if Goff has an off day, that's hard to say. Um, <laughs> you, you can use a running game with that O line, and I think that mm-hmm. if the running game isn't working. You can use Amari St. Brown. You can use Sam the Porter. I think it's a really yeah. promising young tight end. I think it's it's a really good team. And I think the only thing really probably going against them right now is probably the history of their franchise. I mean, they haven't won a playoff game. They've got the longest drought of a playoff win. I think it's 1990 or 1991, their last playoff win. Uh, We're actually second. So both top two streaks could come to an end this season if both teams win a playoff game. And, you know, this Lions team, I think you would think, unless something goes wholly wrong injury-wise, they're going to win that playoff game. And I think you can see them at least in the divisional round. And, you know, if the Eagles and um, Niners play each other seeding-wise... Yeah, the Lions could be, could be that team. That they could, yeah, man. It's and I know they've been a team that's been a lot of people's second teams for years. Browns were the same thing until maybe something they did a couple of years ago. But the Lions have been everyone's second team for years because of how bad they've been. And you yeah. know, I know Fender show Marek Larwood and Aaron Fletcher. They're both just absolutely on cloud nine right now because they're just they probably never seen. I think Marek saw a bit of Barry Sanders era, but. Young Lions Ooh. fans, a bit like ourselves, really. Like our Dolphins. They've seen no success. Yeah, exactly. We, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen two playoff games in my lifetime. We've lost them both. So it's both these franchises are really turning things around. And the Browns, you know, they've only won one playoff game in the last 10, 15 years, but they could win a playoff game this year as well. So there's a lot of teams that have struggled, you know, for a lot of years that are finally getting their their payback. The fans are finally getting rewarded for being loyal to their team, but. This line team, I think, is really good. Dan Campbell is the heart of that mm-hmm. team. It's very rare you mm-hmm. see the head coach be almost a star of the team. You know, the Hard Rocks intro had him in it, which I don't mm-hmm. think the team I've seen have the head coach as part of their intro, um, like properly part of the intro. And yeah, he's just, he just lives and breathes. You know, we we love football. Jurgen Klopp, straight away, he got Liverpool. He got the fan base. He got the club. And Dan Campbell appears to get the mm-hmm. choice. He, he played there, I believe, as well as Dallas, you know, he he gets City, he gets, he's yeah. perfect for my team and he gets the franchise. So I think he's a perfect guy to take him forward and I think we can all say, I think we'll be very happy. Unless you're maybe a Packers, Vikings or Lions or Bears fan, I think yeah. the NFL fans are going to be <laughs> ecstatic when they um, finally win a playoff game and if they can make it to Super Bowl, make it to Vegas, then it's going to be a party in Detroit. If the Bears do go for Caleb Williams, 
does he put number one? Does he put an Eli and demand to not be part mm. of the Bears team because he actually said he doesn't want to go to a losing team? And actually, he's now talking about wanting a share of the actual team. You know, it's getting to that stage where players are now demanding more, right? So that's number one. And number two, if they do draft a quarterback and it isn't Caleb Williams or somebody else, where do you think Field should go? It's interesting, isn't it? I think, I think what, if he's going to leave, I think what would be is I think he will go to the team that trades up for that pick. So, say for example, if right the Giants trade up for that pick no more, they'll, they'll I think they'll use Fields as part of that. I think whether yeah. it, you know, whether it's Arizona, whether it's I don't think Arizona will actually, but you know, I think New England would. I think the Giants would. I don't think the Titans. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe Levis, uh, Commanders. I think they they'll be fine. Atlanta, mm-hmm. I think would. I think so. Me, I think I'm looking at probably um, the likes of because look at it. Like you got the, the Bucks, Jets, Chargers. I don't. I don't think they're going to change from their quarterback. No, no. Uh, the Rams, maybe the Rams. Nah, I, I doubt um, it. I doubt it. But I think they're they're too far back to do it. So I think me personally, I think if he's going to leave, I think it'll be a part of a trade if they do mm-hmm. trade down that pick. And I think I'm looking at probably probably the Giants or the all the Patriots. If I'm honest, um, okay, but. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's hard to know because I I can see him doing one of many things in the draft. Yeah. And I think that you mentioned about Caleb, Caleb Williams. I think he could do an Eli because, as you say, mm. but then he wants to go to a team with a winning record. Who's gonna who's gonna go there as a winning team? That exactly. He needs a quarterback exactly. because you look at the the. It's that way for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah, is that exactly? Yeah, I mean the Vikings. You could say them because they're six and five yeah. clubs. Didn't have the best game on Sunday Night Football. You know, mm. you can look at maybe Seattle if they don't think Gina Smith is the answer. I don't know, man. I think Gina was only a one-year extension, wasn't it, or something like that. So I'm maybe, not entirely yeah. sure. I'm not entirely maybe sure. Here's here another one. Go. You mentioned the Chargers. They're obviously at the bottom of the AFC West, I believe. I think they're at the bottom of the AFC West now, which is insane, man, because the Broncos are on a roll right now. I've heard that Bill Belichick is looking to finish the season, and I said this would be his last season. I said it before the season started. This would be the end of Bill Belichick, and I'm hearing that he'll be going to the Chargers. This is what I'm hearing, because mm-hmm. obviously the Chargers are in turmoil. The Chargers are in absolute turmoil right now, and um, I forget his name already. Kevin, not Kevin O'Connell. Brandon Staley. I don't know if you've seen it, but the, yeah. the press conference where he <laughs> lost his m- Right, <laughs> which was absolutely hilarious to see. There's talk of Bill coming over, Brandon Staley leaving, and Bill, you know, adopting um, uh, Justin Herbert and the rest of the rest of the squad. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, I just feel like the Patriots are done. I mean, they're just not that that, that it's over for them. You know, we we can see that now. But the Chargers, I mean, I don't understand. They've got the second highest payroll in the NFL, and they're the bottom of the AFC West with a guy. Like now I know people get injured over there. Both are now injured. He, you know, he has a history of injuries. Mike Williams is injured. Um, we still got Keenan Allen. So got um, who have they got as their tight end? I'm trying to remember now. You got Donald Parham, one Everett. of them, the big guys, Gerald Everett. So like, I mean, they're not an awful squad. I mean, I will say I don't feel like they're spe- like uh, JC Jackson, who they gave back to the Patriots after spending what sixty to eighty million on on him, was a healthy scratch. How many times? There's a lot of strange contract work and, and, and management over there I'll say but to be at the bottom of the AFC West and have the char- have both the Raiders and the Broncos above you is a serious ass problem it is and I think that I feel so bad for Herbert because he's come to the league mm-hmm. and had a chaos came in and really all the circumstances with the whole Tyrod Taylor doctor situation yeah. you know he's had Anthony Lynn and Brandon Staley that's that's a tough gig because they yeah. really both proved to be not very good head coaches, and yeah. um, I actually think I've got. Th- I've heard a lot of talk of Berchek being traded to the Commanders. I heard that too. Era. And what I can see with that, and I think that's why they hired him in the first place as a coordinator. I can see Kellen Moore getting his chances as a head coach. I can see, but then again, if I have so many years of these bad head coaches who have come in as good coordinators, are they going to do it again? Or if you got yeah. someone like Bill Berchek, who albeit isn't the same as he used to be, isn't getting the wins? He is someone that would provide stability. You knew that he is an experienced head coach. I think that maybe mm-hmm. I thought they, I thought they were going to go for Sean Payton, if I'm honest. But he went to the Broncos. But yeah, I, did hear that. I think it's um, I think Staley's done. I, I don't see any way that he stays from the collapse in Jacksonville to the timeout thing that happened in that Raiders game. Oh, I yeah, it's been a mess. Horrible, been horrible management. A lot of I, he, I'm I hate this new coaching thing of all these fourth down going for it, but he goes for it so much. It's um, it's crazy, but um, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. scary times for Herbert. I think he's got to be careful that he's not 
I don't, I, he's not going to be a Phil, Phil Rivers 2.0 because right now that's his projection. That's, that's the way it's going. Yeah. Um, now, before we go on to Monday Night Football, um, last night's game, um, I mentioned it before, the Vikings did lose. Josh Dobbs' run did come to an end um, as they lost 21-20 to to the Broncos. A great comeback win for the Broncos. A great catch from Court and Sutton to win it in the final minute of the game. But, of course, last night's game was a big game of the week. Chiefs against Eagles, rematch of Super Bowl 57. Um, again, I I had all the talk on my flight last night, I had all the talk and I was on my TV. And then as soon as the game starts, it, it just shuts down and they stop showing it. So I had to watch it. It was all <laughs> YouTube highlights. Um, but Eagles did win. They got their revenge, or somewhat revenge, 21-17 to 17 mm-hmm. over the Chiefs. Um, not the best day for Mahomes. Um, you know, he had the most yards, but only 177 yards. The Eagles... Mm-hmm were great. I mean, they showed one together. I think both teams actually showed their defensive strengths. Um, but I was surprised this game because the biggest strength of the Eagles' um, defence is their run defence. And mm. the biggest strength of the Chiefs' defence is their pass defence. But I found in this game, and this I'm missing completely, the Chiefs, their success mainly came through the, I think, came through the ground game. Right. Yeah. And most of the Eagles' success, I found, came through Devonta Smith and the passing game. So it was, mm-hmm. it was sort of a weird alternative universe for the, for the defences. But um, yeah. for the Eagles, they go 9-1. and one. They're one win clear of the um, Lions, but the Chiefs now fall to the second seed. They'll still win the AFC West, but mm-hmm. I have to be concerned about the Chiefs, about the lack of weapons, because me personally, I know we're still getting numbers, but I think Kelsey is certainly showing signs of somewhat of decline. Oh, of course. Apart from that, you've got Rasheed Rice, but he's a rookie, but apart from that, it's pretty bad. Uh, there was it's probably is like in terms of pure wide receivers, probably is one of the worst rooms in the league. Uh, but what was your take on the game? Uh, I mean, you said it there, but it's strange because they do have one of the worst wide receiver rooms in the league. Yet they are what eight and three or seven and three now. Like, how are they able to do this? They keep finding ways to win. Um, I think you have to give a lot of credit to Andy Reid because obviously he's a mastermind. He's the OC behind all of this. He calls the plays. Um, but really and truly, if you look at their roster, I mean, their defense is great. The defense they have got a good defense, except for the fact that you know they managed to phase out AJ Brown, but Devontae Smith was wide open and had a great game. Um, likewise, Swift had a, had a, had quite a good game as well. And bear in mind, the Eagles are down Dallas Goddard as well. They're starting tight end. Um, I don't know. The, the Kansas are a strange one. I always just, I mean, last season, there was loads of hype about everybody else coming for the Kansas City Chiefs because Tyreek Hill went to Miami and Devontae Adams went to Vegas and whatever, whatever. Um, but nah, I mean, they, they still obviously went and won the damn thing. Um, I can never really count them out just because of their history, their reputation, what they've got in the building with Mahomes and Andy Reid. And you're right, um, Travis Kelsey's definitely you know, in the decline period. But I mean, these guys are human. They're not going to stay that great forever. He's 34 years old, I believe it is. He's obviously got a lot of things going on right now. Obviously, he's all loved up with with Taylor Swift. I'm not saying that's affecting his game. I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think it's a, it's not a stretch at all to say that he's, you know, he's on the decline. And that's, that's a natural thing to happen, especially for him at his age in that kind of scheme where he's been, he's been the number one receiver for what, the, the past few years outside of Tyreek Hill when Tyreek Hill was there. So, I think they'll bounce back. They obviously faced up against a very good team who will be in the playoffs and probably be contender for the Super Bowl once again, as unhappy as AJ Brown is that he never received anything more than one target. Um, but I think we'd all be silly to sort of sit here and say Kansas aren't, aren't going to do this or do that just because every time we think they're not going to do something, they find a way to do it and be it MVS catching the ball that he should be catching or Rashid Rice, you know, doing the impossible Isaiah Pacheco running 150 yards because he's either, he's like a mini Devonta Freeman from the Falcons that he reminds me of. Um, I don't know. I think they'll be all right. I think they'll be all right. I do think they'll be right. They always find ways. There's probably someone they're about to unleash in the next couple of games that you'll be like, who on earth is this? They've done it again. Found a new weapon. Watson seems like he was all right as well. Um, obviously, uh, Mahomes threw that pick to uh, Kevin Byard. He was traded away from, this, from the Titans only, what, a last month or something. So, I don't know. They'll be okay, but bad day at the office for them. Yeah, and I think they'll come back next week. They play the Raiders, so Raiders fans Ooh. can help you. Um, play the oh, Chiefs no. Loss. Well, I, I experienced it earlier this year. It's never nice playing the Chiefs after a loss. It's um, one of the hardest games to have. Um, before we end the podcast for today, quick fire round. This part of the year where we can ask these questions now. First of all, for you, George, who's your MVP pick? Oh, man, I'm going Lamar Jackson. Hey, um, I'm still going Christian McCaffrey, uh, just because of how crucial he is to that nine the side. That yeah. hasn't changed from two years ago for me. And then finally, your Super Bowl matchup as it stands. Who would you pick oh, from in Vegas and Fed? Who would I want or who do I think? Who do you think? 
will be who I think. Oh man, I think I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna say Candace again, just because until I see the proof, I think they'll make it there once again. I'm gonna say, oh my god. I'm gonna say Kansas City will be taking on can I say it? The 49ers. Interesting. I love it. And then they, they've just lost um Hufunga as well to an ACL um tear. Uh, the, the the 49ers. So that's quite a big deal. But the fact that they've brought on Chase Young alongside Bosa is a problem. Um and I think I think they're doing it right. Kittle looks good. Um I forget his name, the wide receiver. Uh uh Debo Samuel, Ayuk. Ayuk, Debo, they all look good and they're all doing it right. And then you insert Christian McCaffrey into that shame. Um that Mike uh into that Sh- Shannon bloody hell, I can't talk. Into the what's his damn name? Good coach. I can't remember his damn name. <laughs> Jesus. Into the Shanahan offense where you can pretty much dunk and dive and put people in and they perform well. So yeah, that'd be good. I, I mean I don't I don't want Kansas to get there. I will say that, but I think they will because they always do. So Kansas and the 49ers in Vegas at the Allegan Stadium, February 11th, I think it is, or 13th. That will be the Super Bowl match, I think. Well, that is still mine as well. Mine hasn't changed from the last time I did this. I said Chiefs Niners a couple weeks ago. I still think they'll, they'll do it. I, I think until I see the Chiefs lose a playoff game, um, I, I until I see them do that, I, I I can't see them not because mm. especially now the Beng- I had the Bengals I thought they might creep up but now Bo Burrow's out yeah a lot of people did I I, I still think yeah. the Bills could get run together and they could do it as a wild card oh, team the Bills the Bills have got a hell of a lot of work in that they got some I know they won but they got some soul searching to do for sure yeah it's, it's gonna be interesting they got the next few games of the Eagles Chiefs and the Cowboys I think they could win oh, those man. games but e- e- equally they could lose all three and they be could. Six and eight and then that that could be real panic time in mm-hmm. Buffalo um, mm-hmm. and hopefully if it's Chiefs Niners. Hopefully, we'll both be there in February if our credential applications work. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Fingers crossed, man. Fingers crossed. <laughs> we'll be there with our $100 on red, putting on the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should be good if we get there. Uh, but yeah. in the meantime, this has been the Across the Pod podcast. So thank you, George, for coming on, first of all. Anytime, man. Anytime. Always happy to do this. Great stuff. And do off here. If you haven't already, check check out George's work on his Instagram, on his Twitter, on his TikTok, on all his socials. Do some great content right now on, on his channel. So do check that out at George on Sports. But in the meantime, this has been the Across the Pod podcast. I've been your host, Andy. This has been George. And we will see you guys for our next episode. <laughs>